Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, President of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's Independence Day week uh, issue of the Libertarian Angle, the show that brings you the libertarian perspective on what's going on in the world. And I'm joined, as I am every week, by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, who is the BB&T Distinguished Professor of Ethics and Free Enterprise Leadership at the Citadel. Richard, good to see you again on the, this week of Independence Day. Absolutely. It's great to be with you and our viewers and listeners who give a little bit of their time to us and to particularly to mark an important day in both American and I would argue world history, a, a revolution that was dedicated to a philosophical principle of freedom. Yeah. July 4th, 1776, the issuance of what I consider the most revolutionary political doctrine in history. So why don't you go first, Richard, give me your perspectives on the Declaration of Independence, the 4th of July, and what we're really celebrating here. Well, I think that the best way to it, as I often try to do, to place it in a little bit of an historical context, we must remember that for all of human history, for all of recorded history, men lived under various forms of tyranny, oppression, and governmental control. Kings and princes, warlords, tyrants who seized power, but under all of these systems, the individual was a slave, a servant, uh, an obedient object to be commanded, controlled, directed, prohibited, and if necessary, sacrificed, besides being fleeced with any wealth that they produce for the purposes of the political leader, or to be put to death. Uh, there, there were uh, governments and regimes and systems around the world where human sacrifices would be made because the individual had no value other than to serve the state as defined by the absolute political rulers. Uh, they were advocates of freedom, they were philosophers of freedom, they were religi religious voices of freedom, but all of this didn't really coalesce in a solidified and coherent philosophy of liberty until really the 1600s and the 1700s, uh, especially marked by uh, John Locke and his two treatises on government in 1690, where he laid out the philosophy that our reason and our understanding of being a creature of a higher authority in, gives each of us certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the right to honestly acquired property. And this philosophy of individual freedom, that the government is the servant and not the master, the protector of rights and not the violator of the liberty and the wealth of the, of, of the people, became solidified finally. In, in less than 100 years after John Locke wrote his two treatises, in that Declaration of Independence, originally penned by uh, Thomas Jefferson and, and then smoothed over with the committee he worked with, into those famous words uh, on the, uh, issued formally uh, in the document of uh, July 4th, 1776, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that governments are formed among men to secure these liberties. And when a government, after long attempts of grievances and appeal and reform, fail to reflect a protector of rights rather than its violator, it is the right of those people to remove that government and establish a new government founded upon the just principles of individual liberty, private property, and rule of law, where the state, again, is the servant and not the master. This is a revolutionary philosophy, Jacob. Never seen, never heard before in the world. And the founding fathers sensed this. They talked about an experiment where the people could be self-governing, free people, without a commanding hand, controlling and directing and oppressing them. And people in Europe living under tyrannies or a form of freedom in Great Britain viewed America as that great experiment in free government and, and the free society. If America could succeed, it would serve as that beacon to inspire other peoples and other places in the world to follow suit and replace their oppressions with regimes of liberty as well, following the traditions and customs of their own societies. That is what made this event in 1776 
which we mark this week, so profoundly important in the entire span of human history, never before and never since, was there a conscious philosophy of establishing a regime and basing it upon principles of the freedom of the individual to his life, his liberty, and his honestly acquired property. Not a pawn in the hands of others, but a free man to peacefully go about his own affairs in voluntary association with others for all purposes that he may find advantageous and mutually beneficial with others. Yeah, I, I think that without a doubt, it is the most revolutionary, radical political concept uh, ever enunciated. And it has, shook, it has shook up the world. It shook up the world at the time. It shook up rulers. It continues to shake up rulers. Because most everybody has this belief that government has the legitimate authority to control and regulate their peaceful activities, uh, what they do with their money, how much money they make. I mean, if, if you want to get a sense of how the whole world has believed throughout history, I mean, look at the way Americans today perceive the welfare state. I mean, everybody just considers that it is within the legitimate realm of government authority to take money from one group of people and give it to another group of people. Who questions that? That's just sort of the natural part of what we consider a free society in America today. Or economic regulations, price controls, minimum wage laws. Most every American looks at this as a natural part of a free market economy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the, the way the world has always perceived people's peaceful economic activities, that government can do this. Along comes Jefferson and says, oh no, that government has no legitimate authority to interfere with the exercise of these fundamental God-given rights. And, and they include, as you point out, life, liberty, the right to acquire property. That's what John Locke was saying in his second treatise on government. Uh, and, Je and Jefferson extends that to just the right to pursue happiness. Well, how does one pursue happiness in the economic realm? He goes out and he, he gets a business going. He works for somebody else. He accumulates wealth. He decides for himself what to do with his own money. Now, clearly, that principle that, that Jefferson has enunciated and that everybody is going to be celebrating this week, it contradicts the whole principle of a welfare state managed controlled economy. You can't, you can't have both. One contradicts with the other. And that's why Jefferson's concept was so revolutionary. It upended the world. It upended the way people were thinking. It, it causes people to confront. Are you really free today? In a society that's a welfare state and a regulated economy, how do you reconcile this with the principles enunciated by, by Thomas Jefferson? It's impossible to do so. In fact, one of my favorite quotes, as you know, Richard, is Goethe's famous quote. Because I think it totally encapsulates the plight of the American people. The quote goes, None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they are free. And that really captures the plight of the American people. They're out celebrating the principles of the Declaration of Independence. They're having their barbecues and so forth. They don't recognize that what they're really celebrating is a way of life that contradicts the principles of the Declaration that they're, they're celebrating on the 4th of July. Yes, the other thing I would like to sort of uh, mention in this is that uh, many people have pointed out, particularly in in, in the, the sort of uh, revisionist or progressive interpretations of American society is the contradiction, the hypocrisy, uh, the, 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 the unprincipled nature of many of the uh, men who founded this country. Thomas Jefferson hails unalienable rights of all human beings to life, liberty, and property. Yet here was a country born with the institution of slavery in its southern half. Uh, did not Thomas Jefferson have slaves? Did not George Washington have slaves? And the list could go on. In fact, in a very famous 4th of July speech delivered by the runaway slave and famous Frederick Douglass before the American Civil War, he challenges his white audience to, to answer the question, what does the Declaration of Independence mean to him as a runaway slave who is subject because of Dred Scott 
to be captured and returned to his master under a Supreme Court decision. Is this not a contradiction? Is it not a contemptible slap in the face to those who's, who, who live in, in bondage and in chains while others hail their liberty? And without a doubt, this was a terrible contradiction and scar in the early America of the colonial period and through half, more than half of the 19th century. But you see, the thing is, ideas have consequences. And the very thing that Frederick Douglass was reminding his white audience about is what it makes it necessary when people have reflected upon and enunciated and articulated ideas, and they involve principles. What do I stand for? Do I really believe that all men are created equal? That they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights? Not just whites versus blacks, not just Catholics versus Protestant versus Jews versus Muslims versus Buddhists, someone born in, in, in Italy versus someone born in Norway versus someone born in the American colonies. These are categorical and they're universal. They apply to all human beings in all places at all times. Is that not why we say today that the, 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 the poor millions who live under Kim Jong-un's dictatorial rule in North Korea are denied their human rights? Does that not imply, no matter how twisted sometimes the concept of human rights is, is used by some, does this not imply that every human being has certain rights as a person that no government should violate and therefore we point our finger in condemnation at Kim Jong-un? That is the concept in the Declaration of Independence. And that is what gnawed at the character and the institutions and the values and the beliefs and the actions of the American people. Do we believe and practice in freedom or are we hypocrites who live half free and half slave? Now it ended in a tragic civil war to about the end of the slave institution with a great loss of life and destruction and a scar in a sense that still is, is, is across the, the, the surface of the country. But it doesn't change the fact that espousing those principles required Americans, not overnight, but over many decades following the declaration to finally decide what they stand for. And that has been the continuance of attempting to practice what you preach in believing that no man should be in chains. No man should have his freedom restricted or, or prohibited or, or denied by your government if you believe in individual liberty and the rights of all. So yes, did the country begin in contradiction and inconsistency? Yes, but enunciating those principles required the country to look itself in the face over decades and answer the question, do we really believe what we say? And forced, unfortunately through a tragic civil war, the end of this terrible and contradictory institution. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a horrible exception. And, um, but, you know, to use the exception, as some people do, to denigrate the declaration itself or any principles enunciated by Jefferson is clearly fallacious. That instead of negating the principles, what we need to do is expand the principles to include African Americans, to include foreigners, to include everyone. Because what Jefferson writes here is not just that Americans have been endowed with these fundamental rights, it's everyone. That's why the Declaration of Independence, you know, it pertains to the United States, but it scares dictators everywhere. Because people have read this in foreign countries and said, wait a minute, Jefferson, what Jefferson is saying is that every one of us has these natural God-given rights. Therefore, no government, not my government, has the authority to interfere, regulate, control, or destroy, infringe these fundamental God-given rights. That's why dictators everywhere and dictatorial regimes are scared to death about the Declaration of Independence. Now, if you go beyond slavery, though, after the post-Civil War, was really a remarkable society. If you take, for example, 1885 America. Now, you know, people sometimes accuse us libertarians of being pie in the sky, that, that we want uh, utopia, or that, you know, with, with what our ideals are. Well, we're not looking for utopia. We're just looking for freedom. Now, look at the society that they brought into existence in, say, 1885. No welfare state, no social security, 
no Medicare, no Medicaid, no income tax, no IRS, uh, no immigration controls, no drug war, no drug laws, no gun control, uh, no central bank, no Federal Reserve, uh, no paper fiat money. They use gold and silver coins as their official money. This is the most radical society in history. I mean, this is what was, what, when, when an American in 1885 celebrated the 4th of July, no passports, no travel restrictions, no sanctions, no embargoes, no national security establishment, no CIA, no NSA, no big Pentagon, no military industrial complex. When they celebrated the 4th of July, Richard, they were clearly celebrating the type of society that is totally different than, from the type of society we live in today the big massive welfare state, the massive planned economy, the controlled economy, the regulated economy, the national security state, the warfare state, foreign interventionism. Oh, well, that's another principle in 1885. No foreign military bases, no foreign interventionism. I mean, this is the model that we want to build on and expand on, but they showed this isn't utopia. This is simply a constitutionally limited government republic in which, which brought into existence the freest society in history, a society where people decide for themselves. And you see, this, they're, they're, this is what has been lost sight of in the United States, that freedom as a principle necessarily involves the right to choose wrongly. Now, we're not talking about violent acts. We all admit that those are, those are wrong, that they should be criminalized, murder, rape, theft, burglary, and the like, fraud. What we're talking about peaceful activities where don't involve where you, where you don't have violence involved or the initiation of force. Uh, for example, a person has a right to decide for himself what to do with his own money, and that includes whether to share it with his parents who might need help, or the needy, the poor. That this is the essential aspect of freedom: the right to say no, the right to be irresponsible, the right to be uncharitable, and that right has. I don't think anybody can question has been destroyed by the welfare state. I mean, the welfare state is based on the assumption that you don't have the right to say no. That's what Social Security is. You don't have a right to say no to your parents when they need help. We're going to force you to do this. And that's why it's imperative that we libertarians continue showing people that if you really want the principles enunciated by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, there is no way those principles can be resolved, reconciled, with a society that's based on mandatory, forced charity that denies the freedom of the individual to say no. Yeah, I, I think what's important on elaboration of, of your, what you've been just saying is that, you see, one reason we can understand why we have the welfare state today, the interventionist welfare state, is that the progressives of the late 19th century, the socialists of the late 19th century, they looked at that period that you're talking about and said, look how evil, how unjust, how unfair, unregulated, greedy capitalism, workers with no safety nets. So the era that we view as a model of, of what a free society could be if it was more consistent and more principally applied is the society that they have used to justify the, the destruction of freedom through the emergence of the paternalistic system called the interventionist welfare state. Rather than, than what they said, look, poverty, hard times. If you look at that period from the end of the, end of the Civil War, 1865, to let's say 1900, that is America's industrial revolution. Standards of living doubled. You had two factors. Output and productivity was increasing uh, uh, goods and services, innovative new goods and services. Prices were falling for many of those years. So any dollar you earned bought more goods and services at the store because each dollar bought more at lower prices. And at the same time, because the rising productivity of labor, given capital investment, better tools, better machines, better equipment to raise the output per hour of a worker, actually money wages were going up at the same time since each worker was more valuable to hire since he was more productive with better machines. So through falling prices and rising money wages on average by again about 50%, standards of living rose between 1865 and 1900 by almost 100%. And that is with a growing population of tens of millions of people coming to the United States competing for jobs. 
and their standards of living all rising. In that era, as you said, with virtually, except for the restrictions beginning in the late 1880s against uh, Chinese and then the Japanese, except for those, those racist-based immigration restrictions, you basically had open immigration for anybody from virtually anywhere else in the world. So you have rising population, falling prices, high rising money wages, and more goods and services to buy at the store. That is the, that is the heralding growth of America as an industrial giant with, with, with a standard of living that became the envy of the world, and all due to the freedom and the liberty and the entrepreneurial opportunity that the left condemned at that time and served as the rationale for them to make the case for the interventions and the redistributions that are now destroying the liberty that our founding fathers tried to leave for us. Yeah, uh, it's a great point about the Industrial Revolution. Uh, I mean, the Nobel Prize winning libertarian economists Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek pointed out that the proper comparison in, in living conditions in the 18, late 1800s is not between then and now. It's between then and what was before. And when you live in a totally impoverished society, which post-Civil War America really was, I mean, the, the war really did devastate large sections of the country, especially in the South, it's not surprising that living conditions are very difficult. When there's no base of capital in society, people are going to be struggling. But what the Industrial Revolution did is it enabled people to engage freely in economic enterprise, including African Americans, who were competing very nicely against whites. I mean, their, their standard of living was rising also. And then over one generation, two generations, all of a sudden people save some of their money because they're able to keep everything. That provides a capital base in which then people become more productive. Then that produces more wealth. And so it starts growing over a period of time. And that's the way to look at this thing. I mean, I, I think, Richard, that even today, we, we are experiencing the benefits of the massive amount of wealth and capital that was being done way back in 1900. Yes. It just it was building this huge base. I think it's also worth pointing out another significant thing about 1776. And that is the, the coincidence that Adam Smith comes out with his book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations, in the very same year. I mean, March because, of 1776. March? Yes. Yeah. I mean, look, look at the re revolutionary concept. You got, you got Jefferson's revolutionary political concept of man's fundamental rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But then Smith comes out with this revolutionary economic concept that says, look, throughout history, governments have regulated economic activity, you know, anti-speculation laws, regulatory laws, price controls, rent controls. He says, all of this has actually hurt people. I mean, it's done in the name of helping people and helping the poor. Smith says, nonsense. It's doing the exact opposite. The best way to benefit mankind, and especially the poor, is for government to, to, to stop doing this. Uh, stop interfering with regulate, uh, and regulating economic activity. Uh, the, the French later came up with a term for Smith's concept, uh, laissez-faire, laissez-passer, let it be, let it pass separate economy and the state. So when you combine Smith's concepts of economic liberty and, and Jefferson's concepts of political, fundamental, natural, God-given rights, all of a sudden you start thinking in terms at, at a higher level that people have a right to engage in economic activity, enter into trades with one another, accumulate wealth. This is not only their fundamental, natural, God-given rights, it actually is a system that benefits mankind and especially the poor. So uh, as, as you've defined the term laissez-faire uh, as let it be, so when the Beatles sang their song, Let It Be, <laughs> that was a subliminal defense of laissez-faire. Do I have that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, let, 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 me, let me just sort of uh, play off uh, a few things that, that you just said. It, it's not just a coincidence. Well, coincidence that Adam Smith uh, published The Wealth of Nations just a few months before uh, the Declaration of Independence is written and then signed in July of 1776. These ideas of personal, political, and economic freedom were seen as bound together an integral whole, a, 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 a single woven tapestry of liberty, if you will. And it is captured, as we have talked about before uh, in the past, is that if you look beyond the famous lines of the Declaration, we hold these truths to be self-evident, and you look at their enumerated grievances, 
which in fact makes up most of that uh, one page document. Most of their enumerated grievances are against British government restrictions on freedom of trade, freedom of enterprise, regulation, market prohibition, restriction on 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 uh, on the uh, the uh, immigration of more people to the colonies to enhance the human capital of this growing society. So, in fact, they were calling in the Declaration for the end of the heavy hand of government regulation through many of those grievances and implicitly, therefore, a system that would not be be attempting to tell people how to live their lives in their free associations, including in the marketplace, in, in, in the society that they wanted. So economic liberty, personal liberty, and political liberty are an indivisible whole of one underlying concept, and that is the individual should be free and not subject to a king, a prince, or a democratic majority, or an arbitrary oligarch. On that fine note, we'll wrap it up. I want to wish you all a very happy Independence Day. Thank you for tuning in, and uh, thank you for supporting our work. Richard, as always, greatly enjoyed the conversation, and I'll see you next week. Until next week, happy Fourth of July. Thank you.